This video lesson is produced by Pipeline Knowledge, LLC. My name is Tom Meissner. In this lesson, we'll talk about oil pipeline operating fundamentals. And this is actually uh, a video of a presentation I made at an Association of Oil Pipelines conference recently. And I thought you might like to be able to watch this as well. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, and I'm going to cover various topics. And as I go through each PowerPoint slide, at the end of the slide, or at least at the end of most slides, I'm going to stop and I'm going to build in about a five second pause. So you can then look at the picture, you can pause the video if you want to think about it some more. So that's the way most of this is going to be laid out. I do have a sequence in a little while where I'm going to go through slide to slide, show some valve switches, and I'm going to leave that just the last slide of that up. So I hope you enjoy this lesson. I'm going to start by talking about the pipeline types. So whenever I think about pipelines, I think of them in terms of the fluids transported, so natural gas, crude oil, refined products, LPGs and chemicals, and specialties. So different types of things move through different lines. Sometimes they're batched together, but these are kind of shipped by themselves usually. And then the functions. Are they a gathering line or are they a transmission? main line or trunk line or distribution line. So the gathering lines are the small lines that generally come from the production processing pad and they bring the gas or the crude oil to the transmission line, which is the larger pipeline. And then the transmission line brings the crude oil or uh, refined products or natural gas basically to the marketplace. In the case of crude oil, of course, it doesn't take the crude oil all the way to the ultimate consumer. It takes it to a trade center or to a refinery or an export terminal or something like that. So the fluids transported and the function they provide. And let me just mention, whenever I talk about the gathering lines, I want to expand on that a little bit because Whenever we have, just a little background, whenever we have a uh, oil or gas well, we generally have everything coming out of the ground on one pipe. That pipe then goes to a production processing pad where we have processing equipment which then separates the oil from the gas from everything else and then sends the gas on its way and then the gathering line comes to that production processing pad and either picks up the oil or a truck may come and pick up the oil. So for example, we may have a natural gas gathering line, refined products transmission line. So just a way of thinking about the different types of pipelines. So let's talk about the different uh, commodities that we move. So natural gas basically moves as one commodity. It moves as methane. It's compressible and it's lighter than air. So if we have a leak from a natural gas line, it basically goes to the air and it dissipates and it doesn't really cause any problem unless it ignites, for example. Moving on then, we have crude oil and refined products. So there are multiple types of crude oils and it depends on the particular uh, geologic reservoir the crude oil came from, what type of crude oil it is. We have multiple grades of gasoline, jet fuel, diesel fuel, those sorts of things. And so crude oil and refined products are generally batched. Different types of crude oil, different types of refined products, end to end, and we'll talk about batching a little bit later, they're generally heavier than air. So if you have a leak with them, they're going to come down and try to find the water. And then we also have highly volatile liquids, HVLs. We a lot of times think about those, that's kind of the family of natural gas liquids. Generally one commodity, but it may be a mixture. For example, if you're coming out of a gas plant, a natural gas plant, we've taken the whole gaseous stream to that gas plant, and then we've separated out the methane from everything else. And so we've taken everything else, and we either send that to a fractionator, where it's divided into ethane, propane, butane, and whatnot, or we send it as a mixed stream along to places where there are fractionators. Uh, it's generally lighter than air, but because of the vapor pressure, if it's cold, it may actually be uh, a cloud may form whenever you have a leak. So natural gas, crude oil refined products, highly volatile liquids, just a summary kind of of the different types of uh, fluids that there are out there that we move on oil and gas pipelines.
Now here's a drawing and it's kind of showing the different value streams, if you will. So on the left hand side there, we start out in the oil field with oil wells. And I already mentioned that we have a f the line that comes up from the well and a flow line comes over to the production processing pad. So you can see those little tanks I have there are meant to be the production processing pad. We go out then and we split and we send the gas along on gas gathering lines to a gas processing plant. The gas is processed there, the gaseous stream is processed there, and as I mentioned, we have the methane going on then to the natural gas transmission lines, may go into and out of storage several different times during its journey, and then it goes to local distribution companies, industrial users, uh, power plants, and those sorts of things. Coming back now to the gas plant, and we'll go back and we'll talk about the natural gas liquids the methane is taken out of. So ethane, propane, butane, and maybe some heavier, that is bigger, molecules. And we may put those on a uh, pipeline then that goes to a gas liquids fractionator where it's made into chemical or separated into, not made into because unlike refining, we don't change any of these molecules. We separate the molecules based on pressures and temperatures. And so we have chemical feedstocks and fuels. And of course, this is where the butane is extracted that we use in our tanks to be able to be able to grill steaks or whatever. So the natural gas liquid stream. Then we have the crude oil main line. It's picking up from gathering stations and I already mentioned it may be trucked to the main line or trucked to a gathering center. Uh, going to a refining center there where it's refined or it may go to a market center like Cushing, Oklahoma, or it may go for export. And then we have refined products main lines which take the refined products, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, whatever, to the local service station or to the airport, the, the place where it's then consumed. Now let's begin to talk about the individual pieces of operations. We're going to talk about crude oil pipeline operations. So remember when I talked about the processing uh, pad or processing location, this is where it is. And so you see, if you look way in the back, back there, there's a little gray box. And that box has got an orifice meter in it. It's measuring the gas. So the, the stream comes from the well and it goes to the separation equipment here that's kind of on the right hand side and we separate the gas from the oil from everything else the gas then goes through that orifice meter I already mentioned the oil goes into the tanks where it's held and then we also have water that's come up with the production stream and that's separated out and put into tanks as well and then that water is hauled off for disposal usually by pumping back underground into places where the water came from in the first place. So there is a picture of a crude oil tank batteries at a production processing uh, pad and the separation equipment. So here is where we gauge the tanks. We measure, we run the tanks, we close the tank, and then we write the ticket. So in this case, somebody is manually going and measuring this. And we'll talk about the steps that we go through to do that measuring. Some of the oil, as I mentioned, is connected to a gathering line, and some of the oil is collected by truck. It just kind of depends. For example, whenever we first begin production, we might not have laid the pipeline yet. We might be waiting for the permits. Or if we've been producing for some period of time, and maybe the production is declining and the pipelines need maintenance, maybe we've unhooked them from the pipeline. Or maybe this production is kind of far away so it doesn't make economic sense to build the pipeline and so we truck it. Custody transfer, and so I want to differentiate a little bit between custody transfer and ownership transfer. So at this point, the custody transfers from the production company to the pipeline company or to the trucking company. Ownership may or may not change at the same time, but here's where the custody is going to transfer and the ownership may transfer or the producer may continue to own it, or perhaps a refiner already bought it, or a marketer bought it. So it's picked up here from these crude oil tank batteries. Now let's talk a little more about custody transfer, and let's talk about gauging. Let's talk about determining 
how much oil is going to be picked up, and let's talk about determining the quality of that oil. So here we're on the top of a tank, right? And you can see we have various different things. If you look at the box first, look over there, there are two glass flasks. We're going to put samples of the crude oil in that flask. Because we want to look at its density, the amount of water that might be in it, those sorts of things. Now if we look over here, kind of in the middle, you can see there's a device that is hanging on the side of the tank. That is a crude oil thief. Or maybe we just call it a thief because you can use it for refined products as well. And you see there's a uh, rope or cable going down. That rope or cable is connected to a thermometer. Because one of the things we want to do is we need to know what the temperature is of the oil in the tank. Because oil is sold at 60 degrees. Oil expands and contracts just like other types of fluids or other types of things depending on temperature. So we've agreed for commercial reasons to correct everything, correct the volume back to 60 degrees F. And so we're measuring the temperature there. There you can see I've got a lot of labels. We have a rope holding the thermometer that I mentioned. We have the thief there, and we'll talk about the thief more in a bit. And then over here we have the flasks, which I already mentioned. Now here's a pretty straightforward picture. This just shows you an example of that thermometer that I mentioned. If you look, uh, he happened to have it hanging off of a gauge line there. You can see the yellow thermometer where the mercury goes up and down, and then there's a little cup at the bottom of there. So they let, they let this down to the middle of the tank, kind of the middle of the oil. First thing they do is put that in. It equilibrates with the temperature in the tank. Then they pull it up, kind of the last thing they do before they uh, shut everything up, and they have a little cup there to be able to have some crude oil to stay around the little bulb to keep the temperature constant. So checking the temperature, you can see there's the little cup that has held that crude oil. Now another thing we want to do in addition to checking the temperature, we want to measure how much oil is in the tank. What we do is we measure how much is in the tank when we first start out, we withdraw the oil, and then we measure, in this case, how much is left in the tank. And the difference between what the tank started with, what the tank ended with, is the amount that we withdrew. And so these tables have tank tables, or these tanks have tank tables. And that says at a certain level, here's how much crude oil in barrels is in the tank. So we look at how much we had to start with, we look at how much we had to end with, and the difference is how much we took out. And that uh, measuring tape is dropped down beneath that gauge hatch, and there's a little, little datum plate down there. So that datum plate, which is an, and it doesn't move, it's in a known location, that's what the measurements are, are off of. So they have a little tape down, a little paste down there. If you look closely, you can see that we have an area where the pink kind of gets less distinct. They put some paste on it so that, in this case, this is gauging when the tank, when they're finished taking stuff out of the tank, how much is left in the tank. Okay, now let's talk about the thief a little bit more. So the purpose of the thief is to get a sample from the tank. This is lowered down into the tank. There's a little trap door at the bottom, so it's lowered down as a tube, so it goes through the fluid. When it gets to the point where they want to take the sample, they close the trap door uh, by releasing a little spring, and then they pull this up. And so you can see there we have some crude oil that's in that thief. Let's talk about a couple pieces that I have labeled here. First, there's the access hat. So it's a way to be able to open up and be able to access this tank. There then we have the thief, which is that device that ha is hanging down in the tank. There's a little catch, and if you imagine you can take that catch and see over here on the right hand side there's a little rod. The catch goes in the little hole in the rod and it makes that trap door stay open. So when they get this lowered to the point where they uh, need to be able to close the trap door, they basically snap the rope, releases the catch from the rod, trap door closes. There then is a hydrometer. So what they're doing with the hydrometer is they're measuring the density of the crude oil. Density of crude oil is a surrogate, basically it's an indicator of the quality of the crude oil because certain products 
certain amount of gasoline, certain amount of diesel, certain amount of jet fuel are going to come out of the various different densities, the various different mixtures of hydrocarbons, which after all is what crude oil is. And then finally, there's that rod to the trap door on the bottom to make it close. So an overall look at a thief. The purpose of the thief, as we said, was to get a sample of the oil. Now let's talk a little bit more about the thief. And here's a picture of it. You can see this is the bottom part of it. So there's that little trap door I've been mentioning right now. It's closed. There's a valve, and so the valve is on the side, and it's going to be used to withdraw a sample of the sample. So we got a sample from the tank, and now we're going to take a sample of the sample and put it in a smaller container. Another purpose of the thief is to be able to go down to the bottom of the tank and collect the sample and see how much water is in the bottom of the tank. So there you can see the water cut. Down in the bottom there's water. Of course it's heavier than the crude oil and on the top. And so we don't want a bunch of water and accumulation on the tank because that can get sucked out into the suction line. So we're sampling to see how much water is in the bottom of the tank using the thief to be able to do that. So now you can see he's holding in his hand the small flask. When we looked originally, the flask was over in that carrying container. Now we've got a sample of it. And so he is going to take this sample down and he's going to do some other testing with the sample. And then he'll take the crude oil that's in the thief and he'll pour it back into the tank. We just were getting a sample there. So just a little view of the thief with the guy holding a sample in his hand. Up to now, I've been showing you slides of manual gauging. So instead of manual gauging, climbing up on the tank and measuring, we may have an automatic custody transfer unit. And I've got a lot more about automatic custody transfer units in the equipment and components uh, lesson. So I'm not going to talk about that a bunch here. But here, he, this guy is taking a sample out of that container there, that pot back in the back. This is an automatic measurement unit. Uh, crude oil has been going through it, and it's been taking a small sample and collecting it. Now he's taking a sample of the sample. So at this point, the operations between manual gauging and using an automatic custody transfer unit kind of become the same. He's got a sample. Now let's talk a little bit more about processing this sample. There you can see the guy is holding two empty sample flasks. Uh, right there, they're labeled. And then back here is the centrifuge. And right now the lid is open. We'll talk about the centrifuge a little bit more. If you look right there, there's a heater block. And that heater block is to heat the samples to a certain temperature. There are a lot of measurement specifications, measurement standards on how we do all this stuff because it will determine how much crude oil we say we're taking custody of. So here's a closer shot of that heating uh, box or the heating element on the side and you can see that there are four flasks in there and you can see right there that one has a thermometer in it. So the specifications tell us how hot to heat the sample before we put it in the centrifuge and spin it. Now here's a picture of the centrifuge. The uh, lid is open. You can see we've got the, the sample flasks in there, and this will spin it around. So all the heavier stuff then goes to the bottom. We're looking for contaminants, water, and other debris because we don't want to pay for that, and that's a quality issue as well. So we're going to spin the oil. I don't have a picture of this going around and around. That would be a safety hazard. We close this and then spin those tubes around. Now, here you can see he's spun the tubes around, he's brought those out. If you look closely, you can see graduations on those cylinders. So he's holding it up to the light and he's looking at how much, let's call it bad stuff, basic sediment, basic sediment and water that's gone to the bottom. You may have heard basic sediment, BS, or 
basic sediment and water, BS and W. So a quality measure that we're checking for. So if you think about it, we don't want anybody to come and mess with the sample because that determines the quality. So here there's actually little seals put, seals on the lid, seals on the valve, and he cuts those seals off what he needs to in order to be able to process the crude oil, but then he puts new seals back on and he writes those down in a book or scans them with a handheld device to be able to keep track of that. And you didn't see that in the pictures I have, but this was the person that worked for the pipeline company. There were two other people there that worked for the producer and they were watching him as he measured, witnessing the measurement. Very common to be able to do that because of its importance. So that series of slides we went through was focusing on gathering, particularly focusing on the gauging part of gathering. Uh, lots more going there, don't have time to cover all that in this short video, but now let's switch to crude oil mainline operations. So here's a booster station. It's actually a booster station and an origination station. If we look here, there's a breakout tank. So what's going on here, down in the way foreground, there's a, a pipeline coming in from up north, and it's moving crude oil past this station, and there are three pumps and three motors there that are putting pressure back into the pipeline to push the crude oil along. Now there's something else going on here that I want to point out to you. You see that other tank there that's not a breakout tank? That's actually a gathering tank. So there's a gathering system in this area and crude oil being produced in this area is going into that tank. Now when that tank is full, what do we do? So we're going to switch around the operations and we're going to start diverting the crude oil from this incoming line into that breakout tank. Breakout tank is something we call the tank that's used basically for operating purposes. We have to break out, take the crude oil out of the stream. The reason we're doing here, that here is so we can put that other crude oil that's gathered in that area into the line. So the people in the, in the control room uh, click on some icons, move some valves around, divert the line into the breakout tank and start pumping out of the other tank with the crude oil which is a different quality that was gathered in this area. When that tank gets done, what they do is rearrange some valves again, uh, quit taking out of that tank that has no label, the one in the background, and start taking the line past again. So they quit putting it into the breakout tank. Now the breakout tank has got uh, crude oil in, we've got to get that crude oil out, right? So then they start withdrawing it from the breakout tank and injecting it, putting it into the stream that's going by so the volume going out of this station is more than the volume coming into the station by the amount we're supplementing from that tank. So a crude oil mainline booster pump station, and we've got booster pump stations about every 40 or 50 miles along the line to be able to put pressure back into the line. We lose pressure due to friction loss as the crude oil moves through the pipeline. So this is just a picture of one of the operations we have for crude oil mainline. So that was a little bit about crude oil mainline operations and of course it ends up at a refinery or it ends up at a tank farm, market center, export terminal, something like that. Now let's move on to refined products operations. So here I've done a little drawing that has an origination pump station. Three tank farms, tank farm one, tank farm two, tank farm three, all feeding this pump station. So in the pump station we've got a manifold that's built there and then we're feeding the pumps, going through meters, a scraper launcher, and then going out. So we will sequentially pump from one tank farm, then we'll switch to the other one, we'll switch to the other one. You can see I've shown the oil, uh, I probably should say distillate in uh, red, and the gas, I should probably say gasoline, in blue. So origination pump station for refined products terminal. Here now is a refined products tank farm, a picture I took off of Google Earth. And so if we look here, there's the refined products tank farm. And then here on the right hand side is the pipeline pump station. So in this case, the tanks were owned by one entity, the pump station was owned by another entity. What we're going to do is, the next picture I'm going to show a close up of this particular area 
in the little yellow box. So I'm not going to leave this slide up here. We'll go on to the next slide. So now here we have a little close-up, and you, you can see some of the tanks here. If we look closely on the left-hand side in there before the trees start, kind of in the middle, that's where all the manifolding is. So the manifolds will come, a pipe will be coming from each of these tanks into a header with valves on it, and then they'll direct the flow using that. The flow comes over here to the right side, and there's a uh, pump station there that's originating product from that particular tank farm onto this pipeline. And so uh, the one on the left, because of its side is act size, is actually manned 24-7. The one on the right is not manned 24-7. There's somebody operating it from a central control room. People go out there from time to time and check it out. So an origination station. Here's a picture of a receipt booster station. What's happening here, there's a whole bunch of tank farms around this area. And each of those tank farms has a manifold, so they're directing the flow from their tank farm. And over here, by this receipt booster station, is another manifold. And so you've got lines coming over from each of those tank farms to here. And then depending upon what the orders say, they will open valves, close valves, and be able to pump from one tank or the other tank. It just depends on what the schedule says. So there, underneath there, there are two single stage pumps. And so what they're doing is they're adding pressure to the pipeline and pushing this uh, product that's being taken here up several miles to the main line origination station. This is just a little booster station from these tank farms. And I want to point out one other thing to you that's kind of interesting. This is refined products. Back there's an ethanol tank. The way I can tell it's an ethanol tank, if you look at it, it has black mold growing on it. If you go to refined products terminal and you see a tank with a lot of sort of black mold, that's probably the ethanol tank. So the mold is not going to grow on the hydrocarbon vapors, but on those organic vapors it does. So a receipt booster station. Now here's a picture of a mainline pump station. This is a refined products pump station. You can see they have one, two, three pumps. Nobody here is assigned here on a full-time basis. Technician comes by here maybe several times a week, checks it out, makes sure everything's going okay. So completely automated, completely operated from the central control room. Okay, now let's go to the end of the line. This is a refined products delivery facility. So you can see we're going to take a close-up of that area. But before we move on to that close-up, in the middle we've sort of got the uh, pipeline facilities. On one side there's a tank farm for one shipper. On the other side there's a tank farm for the other shipper. A couple of other things going on this pic on this picture I want to mention before we go on to the next one. So if you, you can see there, there's a transmix tank. So when we're batching product end to end, we will get some contamination between the products, for example, gasoline and diesel fuel. And that's interface material. And so you've probably heard interface and transmix, and nobody has really told me what the difference is, so I came up with my own definition. To me, interface is the mixing that occurs and is in there when it's in the pipeline. If we decide to take it out and put that mixed product into a separate, ta separate tank, a transmix tank, it becomes transmix. If we don't put it into a tank, we instead split it into, or we don't put it into a transmix tank, we instead split it into the regular gasoline or whatever, it may never become transmix. There, if you look closely, we can see some scraper traps, probably an incoming trap and an outgoing trap. There, if you look closely, we can see a bi-directional pipe prover. So they're calibrating the meters with this. And we can talk a lot more about this when we go into equipment and components. There is a cone roof tank. And there is an external floating roof tank. So a number of different things we can look at and pick out from this particular picture. And then we'll go and we'll talk about that area over there that it is in the yellow. So here's a close-up of the area we talked about. Now let's look at a couple things here. You can see there, there are two lines coming from this pipeline facility over to that 
delivery facility through that tank farm. One of those is probably for gasoline and the other is for distillate. So very common to have two different lines. We want to minimize the cross-contamination and they probably go to a manifold that's got a separate gasoline header and diesel header. So two different lines going over. You look there, we've got the receipt manifold. So a uh, very common type of practice to have these put together. And somebody uh, may be at that facility 24-7, somebody may only be there part-time. It all really kind of depends on how much automation we have and how much is going on in that particular area. Now here's a smaller refined products terminal. You can see several tanks there. The refined products tank farm. We have the truck rack over there, so that's where the truck comes and loads up with gasoline, diesel fuel. And you can see down there we had delivery by rail also, so there's a rail spur. So just a small refined products tank farm, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that go on in the tank farm in a bit. So here's the truck rack. Uh, underneath there we have load arms back in the back. You can barely see them. So these are, are um, pieces of equipment that are on swivels. So you can bring them down and get them lined up to be able to load the truck. The meters are there uh, on the outside of the terminals. This is set up for being able to load trucks with gasoline or diesel fuel. Here then is a picture of a close-up of loading this truck. You can see we have the load arms hooked up down there, uh, truck manifold, and we've got four different products that are lo being loaded. So this truck has got a different compartments, and uh, we can load different types of products in different compartments. They have the right different inventory whenever we go to the station we're delivering it to. There are the load arms I mentioned earlier. Going across the top of the truck then, there's a pipe that catches the vapors that are displaced when we're loading this uh, gasoline or diesel fuel. There's a vapor hose, so the pipe goes across the top, it uh, collects the vapors, takes it to this hose to take it out to a vapor disposal unit or vapor recovery unit. There's a flame arrester, so if we have any fire, we don't have the flame fronts uh, migrating between the uh, rack or coming from the um, vapor disposal or vapor combustion unit into the rack. Refined products transport loading. Here are examples on the, the left of a vapor, rec vapor disposal unit or vapor combustion unit. It's the same thing. Some people call it vapor combustion unit. Some people call it vapor disposal unit. VDU, VCU. So the ones on the right are basically the same as the ones on the left, except they have shrouds, basically sheet metal put around them so you don't see the flame as much. And you'll notice in uh, the one on the right, there are two of them. Very common to have two because if you have one go down, you want to be able to have the other one sized for the full loading capacity. So there's basically a spare, if you will. So we've been talking about field operations, things that happen out in the field, out in the pipeline. Sometimes those things are being done by people physically located in the field. Often they're being done by people in the central control room. So let's talk now about the central control room. And let's start out talking about batching. I mentioned that already. So here is a complex crude oil cycle. What we're trying to do, if you look, is we're trying to put the stuff next to each other that will downgrade or contaminate what is next to the least. So for example, in the front end of this batch, on the right, we have heavy high sulfur crude oil next to light high sulfur crude oil. So we don't want the sulfur to go from the one into the other, or if it does in this case, it's okay. So we're lining these up and we're protecting the butane, for example, with light sweet. We, we may put condensate in, it just depends. So a crude oil cycle, and there we have a refined product cycle. So we start out with diesel, jet fuel. In this case, we're protecting the jet fuel from the gasoline with uh, more, another batch of diesel. So this is just kind of a, a typical refined product cycle. The fluids with similar characteristics are put next to each other. Batched pipelines often have a set time, particularly refined products. Either they operate on a seven day or a 10 day cycle. Very common to do that.
So we've got our cycle set out and we're pumping along. In this case, the flow you can see is from left to right and we are pumping, we're starting out on the left at 5,000 barrels an hour with green. We're delivering off at some point 2,000 barrels an hour, some physical location, and so our flow has slowed down from 5,000 barrels an hour to 3,000 barrels an hour, and we're moving there a 75,000 barrel batch of yellow, and we're delivering off at 750 barrels an hour, so we're slowed down again to 2,250 barrels an hour. Then we have a 100,000 barrel batch of blue, we're delivering off a thousand barrels per hour, so we're slowing the flow along. So in a long distance pipeline, you may be making two, three, four deliveries at intermediate points as you're going along. So we have to keep up with the, where these batches are and deliver them off at the right place. Intermediate deliveries are made, the pipeline rate slows down accordingly to accommodate that reduction in the volume that's moving past that point. The interface is allowed to go past usually those intermediate points and then it is taken out at the end, and we talked about transmix and interface a little bit already. So intermediate deliveries and flow rates ending up finally at the end and taking the transmix, the mixed stuff, particularly on the refined product side between gasoline and diesel, out at the end. Now I'm going to go through a series of slides that's kind of interesting. It starts at the beginning where we're first taking receipts into the pipeline. We have two tank farms here, the one on the left, one on the right. The one on the left has uh, four products, which I've colored as green, red, blue, and yellow. And then the one on the center, or kind of the right, has yellow, red, and green. So right now, we're, going, we're pumping green from that tank farm that's evidenced by the green valve being opened. So green is coming and going past and uh, the valve out of the second tank farm, which we're not pumping from, is closed, it's black. So the next thing that's going to happen is uh, we want to run red from that other tank farm. So what's the first thing the person does? The first thing they do is go and make sure that valve is open. They may or may not have control over that valve themselves. They may have to call the tank farm people and say, we want to make sure that valve is open because Whenever we begin to put red into the line, or hope we have red, we want to make sure that valve is open. So the only valve that's keeping us from pumping red right now is that black one. The next thing they do is open that red valve, because they want to pump red from that tank farm over to right over here, where they're going to start pumping red from the tank farm in the middle, because they know the next thing they're going to do after they get done pumping red from the tank farm in the middle is pump red from the tank farm on the left. And we don't want to have that line laid down with green whenever they want to pump red. So they're pumping red, they close that valve, they pump red to this point, and then they open the valve and they'll close that valve. So now we're all laid down with red, the line fill is laid down with red, so whenever we quit pumping from that tank farm in the middle and close that valve, we'll be able to open that black valve that's got the oval around it and pump red from this other tank farm. They know how many barrels it is from the one tank farm to the other tank farm. They know the rate at which they're pumping, so they can calculate when the interface is going to get past that point and they can begin then pumping red from the center tank farm. Of course, they've probably also got a color detector or a uh, densitometer there as well, perhaps both, so they can tell whenever that interface comes by. So a lot of things the control room operators need to keep up with. And we've got some very nice tools to be able to help them do that. Here's just a picture of a booster station. So that shows the booster station is shut down. Green is going by route right now. Red is in the pump. So we're keeping track of what's in the pump because if we're going to start up that booster station, we don't want to put red into the green. So we're keeping track of all that stuff as we're going along. Now this slide has a bunch of stuff on it. Let's start at the top and work our way down. And what we're talking about is, in this case, we have two products, product one, which is blue, and product two, which is yellow. 
and we have interface in between them. So whenever we are coming along and we're getting to a point where we're going to make a delivery, we can either quit putting product one into uh, the tank that contains product one, contains blue, uh, right where we have that clean cut and leave the interface behind. And we can take all of that interface and yellow into the yellow tank. And so we know the specifications. An example, for example, is that we have, if we have premium gasoline as product one and mid-grade as product two, you can see that putting premium into mid-grade doesn't cause a problem, right? Another cut strategy is we can cut right in the middle. So if, again, we have premium and mid-grade, we may be able to just take half of the interface into the premium tank and half into the mid-grade tank and not put either one off the specification. Of course, we'll lower the specification of the premium a little bit and we'll raise the specification of the mid-grade. Another cut strategy, this is where we generate transmix, is to be able to take product one when the interface first shows up, we switch out of tank that goes, that product one goes to, we switch into the interface and when the interface comes by and product two, clean product two starts showing up, then we put that into the product two or the yellow tank. So uh, different cut strategies when you're dealing with a batched pipeline. One more uh, example of uh, batches and then we'll go on to the next thing. So in this case, we have a delivery we're gonna make into this delivery station. And we've got four tanks, two that have oil in it, maybe jet fuel and diesel and then two that have uh, gasoline in. Maybe uh, it, they have regular and premium and they're getting the mid-grade by mixing. Don't know, but just an example. So as the interface comes along, look over on the left-hand side. We generally have an outstation detector located a known number um, or amount of line fill out of the station. And it shows, it tells us when that interface arrives at that, line, that location. We have another detector, IS, in-station detector, and it tells us when the interface arrives there. So let's come through and talk about it. Let's say that the interface comes by the outstation detector and there is an alert that comes up. So we know when it's arrived at that location. Let's say that the line fill between the outstation and the in-station is 2,000 barrels an hour and we're pumping at 4,000 barrels an hour. Then we know that if everything's working fine, the interface should show up at the in-station detector in half an hour. If it shows up in half an hour, everything's good, and then we can make our cut. Probably what we do if this is an intermediate station is we let the interface go by, and then we direct the flow into either the oil header or the gasoline header, which then is hooked up to the tanks. So an easy way to be able to know how to do this. In the old days, we used to do all this sampling manually, now, much more automation, much better, and many systems are set up to make these switches happen automatically. So the controller is watching, but uh, kind of autopilot. The system is flying itself as long as everything is going well. So detecting batch changes. Okay, we're moving away from uh, refined products operations, control room operations. One last topic I'm gonna to talk about is pipeline pigging because a lot of people have interest in that. So I've got a series of slides here and these came from a natural gas, but it would be exactly the same if we were talking about um, oil, except that you would of course drain the oil out. Here the methane is released uh, out of the, the uh, barrel. So there's, there's the barrel of the, uh, the launcher. In this case, it's a launcher. They've, drained all the, ga the uh, natural gas out of it. They're opening this door. And you can see the line back at the back. That's the line that's going to be behind the pig and is going to push it out. Now they've got the pig. A very simple pig there, a piece of pipe with flanges on the end and poured urethane cups. They're carrying it over and they're going to insert it in the barrel. Here's a close-up of loading it, so you see they've got it, they're going to push it in the barrel, and then they need to get it pushed all the way to the place where the barrel gets narrowed down to the diameter of the line, so it gets seated in there. So you can see they've got it, and they're going to bring it in and put it inside. 
the launcher barrel. Now I mentioned they need to get it seated all the way in there to where the normal line diameter is and they've got this pole they're going to push it in with. You don't want to use a steel pole and potentially get sparks so they're going to push it in and get it seated in there so when the gas comes it can push it out. Here's a picture you can see they've got this back hole bucket they're pushing the barrel getting it in there so firmly seeding the pig is important. If it's not properly seeded, the fluid may bypass the pig and it may not go out. So you understand there's a barrel which is about two inches or two diameters larger than the pig and then there's a reducer that brings it down to the diameter of the pipeline, in this case 30 inches, and they push it in there so the fluid can't just kind of make that pig bobble around. So getting it firmly seeded into that line Here you can see they've taken the pole out, they've got it seated in there, there's the little arrow that shows the back of that pig, and over there the yellow arrow shows where the kicker line is, or the line that comes in back, pushes it out, they open and close a series of valves to direct all the flow back behind the pig after it's launched, of course, they shut all that back off again, so launching a pig. Now believe it or not, this is exactly the same pig. This is at the other end. This was a run of about 70 miles in a natural gas pipeline. You can see there the pig has arrived. They're going to take it out. They're going to, and then this is a very clean line, very little debris. It's only pigged about twice a year. And so one of the questions usually is, how often do you have to pig a pipeline? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what's going through the line, uh, what the condition of the line, and a lot of things. And you learn that over time. If too much comes out, you pig it more often. If not very much comes out, you pig it less often. Not very scientific, but it works. There are various different types of pigs. This is a brush pig. You can see we have the arrow pointing to the bristles, so this is a smaller diameter. This is probably a crude oil pipeline. Here you can see the brush pig following a run. You can see there's an oval that shows some of the debris on there. So it's run along and it's cleaned out the pipe. And of course, we take this debris, it takes it to the lab, and the lab analyzes to help understand what's going on in the pipeline, just like a blood sample from a human. And of course, there are different types of pigs. This happens to be a brush pig. There are poly pigs and scrapers and a bunch of different things, all designed to do a particular process. We may use chemicals help clean the pipeline as well, get this stuff to come loose. So that wraps up this uh, video lesson. This slide says questions or comments. Obviously you can't ask any questions or make any comments now because you're not here when I'm videoing this. But if you ever do have questions or comments, please contact me at tom at pipelineknowledge.com. Feel free to subscribe to this YouTube video so you get notified when more tutorials come up. And I'd be very happy to talk to you about presenting classes about oil and gas pipelines.